I'm glad you could join us today. We're talking about God's opportunity and our ability to accept that. And we've been talking about peace the last couple of weeks. We've been talking about the fact that we don't very often find peace in our world today. And that there are many times where we find ourselves in situations that are not peaceful. I don't think Jesus' life was filled with situations of peace, and yet Jesus was a man of peace. And so we've talked about being able to deal with peace, have the peace of Jesus. We talked also about the idea of peace coming from the fact that we have a certain amount of discipline and that we have learned in order to have peace. And that's just one of those things that develops as we grow into maturity, is that we're able to have greater peace. Well, today we want to talk a little bit about peace and forgiveness, because I think this is an important step in our finding peace. A lot of times, even if our surrounding is fine, we are not, because there are things that have gone on in the past and we don't have peace with other people. Our surroundings we can deal with, our discipline we can deal with, but when it comes to other people, we seem to have a great deal of difficulty. And so I saw this, there is no peace without forgiveness. It's not a Bible verse, it's just something that's true. Because as we look at the Bible, we find most of the Bible is dealing with forgiveness and dealing with how we might be forgiven. And a lot of times the difficulty between people, the lack of peace, comes from disagreements. And so they argue about these disagreements. If we could solve the disagreement, would that make peace? And a lot of times that's our approach to it. It's let's solve the disagreement or the argument, and then therefore there will be peace after that. I think more it's about making peace between the people than it is about solving the argument. If we look at the life of Jesus, he didn't try and solve the argument. He tried to make people holy. And as he made people holy and helped them to deal with their sin, they found a way to make peace with others because they first had to deal with their own sin and the fact that they were sinners and their need for forgiveness. And when we do that, it makes a whole lot easier for us to help others with forgiveness and for us to forgive them because we know we need it first. And so we may want to look at who's right, who's the one who wins the argument, and how do we decide that? Is it because we have a scripture and the Bible says, therefore, you're wrong and I'm right. Or is it because of logic? The fact that mine, my idea makes more sense than your idea. Or is it just the fact that more people agree with me than with you? And so we stack up opinions on each side and say, well, you know, this is the majority opinion. So therefore, it must be right. But Jesus doesn't seem to approach the disagreement on the emphasis of right or wrong. He seems to approach it on holy or unholy. Is it about sin? Is there forgiveness? Is there a place of grace and mercy? And that is what makes peace more than anything else. And so Jesus is more about how to make peace rather than how to win an argument, because it's not in winning the argument. It's in finding true peace with God and peace with other people. And so how do we do that? Let's look at a few Bible verses that talk about that. The first one we want to look at today talks about Jesus and the time when Jesus gives the model prayer. This is not Jesus' prayer so much as teaching his disciples how to pray. And so the end of that says, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so even the prayer of Jesus as he tries to teach other people how to pray deals with this concept of forgiveness. And this is the most basic, the most simple one. There are many passages that talk about forgiveness, and a lot of times they deal with a different situation. This one's the first. This is the basic. This is open. 
He says, we recognize that we have debts, we have sins, we have mistakes, things that have happened, and we need forgiveness. And so that's what he's trying to describe here. And so his prayer to God is forgive us our sins or our debts the same way we forgive everybody else. And then the tag at the end is, if we forgive others, then God will forgive us. But if we refuse to forgive others, then God won't forgive us either. And so this is maybe one of the hardest concepts for us to understand. If you re- refuse to forgive, your father will refuse to forgive you. Well, but we're right. Yeah, it's not about being right. That's not how God decides these things. Because in order for forgiveness to take place, it is the forgiveness of something that is wrong. You can't forgive something that's right. We don't forgive something that's correct. Uh, And and so we're not trying to get them to be right or to get them to be correct so that we can now forgive them. Because what's the point of forgiving if they're already right and correct and logical and everything is good? There, There is no forgiveness. Forgiveness only comes when there is something that is wrong or sinful. And so the fact that they are still wrong and sinful, he says, therefore, you forgive that and God will forgive when we are wrong and sinful. And so I think that's an important first step for us to realize. Our forgiveness is not about the times when we have convinced people to correct themselves. It's about the time when they're still wrong and they're still bad and they're still not doing what they should. And we forgive the bad. We forgive the sin as if it's gone and not there anymore. The other thing you notice from this passage is there's no talk of repentance. It's not if they repent. It's simply a matter of you do it. And so as we look at the passage, if you forgive others, your heavenly father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, they are trespassing. Not not if they ask, just you do it. Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. We have the example of Jesus that makes a lot of sense with all of this, because Jesus is the one who begins all of this as we look at him on the cross and his very words to the people who are crucifying is, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Well, he's on the cross So is Jesus asking God to do something he's not doing, so he's not forgiving, but he's asking God to forgive them? No. I think Jesus is saying, I forgive them, and he's praying for them. God, can you make a way of forgiveness? Can you make a way of repentance for them? Interestingly enough, the answer is no. God does not forgive them at this point. And we know that because later on, Peter is going to talk to them about their sin of crucifying Jesus, and they're shouting to crucify him, crucify him, and he's going to hold that charge against them because God did not forgive. But the point here is that Jesus did. Jesus did forgive them, and there was no repentance. They were not sorry one single bit. In fact, they were still angry and upset and enjoying the crucifixion, if that's possible to enjoy. And that's who they were, and that's who Jesus forgives. Yeah, that would be a terrible sin. Somebody who's killing you, I would say that's a sin, not just against me, but that's a sin against God. And Jesus says, I'm going to forgive them. And then it's up to God whether God forgives or not. And so again, forgiveness is when there's something wrong. Well, obviously there would be something wrong here, something where they are killing Jesus and murder is a sin. Murder is wrong, especially if the person is innocent. And so that's what they're doing. And Jesus says, for my part, I forgive. 
but then they still have to deal with God. Don't think that we hold God's opinion and that God won't forgive unless we do. That's not true. Or that God is somehow waiting for our permission for him to forgive. That's not true either. You see, I think God expects us to forgive regardless because we have no right to hold any sin against anyone because we are sinners ourselves. And how could we do that when we do exactly the same thing? But God, however, is a just God. And so God does deal with sin and deal with all of us as his people. And so why would we forgive? Well, it's not just because of them or what they deserve. Forgive others not because they deserve forgiveness, but because you deserve peace. If we're the ones who is hanging on to it and we're the ones who is trying to make the justification, then we can't be at peace. There is no peace without forgiveness. And so this is something important that we need to know that we have to learn. We forgive partly because we have no right to hold, but also we forgive because we need the peace. We need to be able to let go of it and let God deal with these people. Let God worry about them. It's really not up to us anymore because we're sinners the same way they are. And God will deal with us as well. And so in Luke 17, we see this passage where Jesus talks to his disciples about forgiveness. And he said to his disciples, temptation to sins are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and he turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And so as Jesus deals with this concept of forgiveness, it's a little bit different than the first time he's dealing with just forgiveness on a personal level. You see, now he starts dealing with forgiveness and the fact that we might be able to cause someone to sin. Well, what does he mean by that? That we might cause someone to be angry at us and uh, do something wrong to us? That wouldn't fit the context, would it? It's that we might cause someone to sin against God. And so this passage is not just about something that would be wrong to us. This is also a passage that would be wrong to God. And he gives the consequence, if we are the ones who provoke someone into sin or entice someone into sin, and I understand that we can't make anyone sin, we just provide a better opportunity and maybe an example that leads them into sin. And as we lead them into sin, we're the ones not responsible for doing it because each person is responsible for himself but we are responsible for the influence we have upon that person. And our influence has made them go ahead. And our influence has caused these little ones to sin. And so he says, pay attention to yourselves. And then he gives this, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Well, if he sins against you, this is way different than Matthew 6. But I think this is if he sins against God, rebuke him because his soul is at stake. And if he repents, we'll forgive him so that he's able to be forgiven by us and by God. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times, well, we understand that because we're good for once, maybe twice, but about the third time, we start saying, now, wait a minute, I think you're doing this on purpose. And we don't want to forgive so much after that. And Jesus doesn't give it. He says, if he turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you forgive no matter how you feel about it. No matter whether you feel like he's doing it on purpose, no matter whether you feel like he ought to know better, uh, he shouldn't be so weak. And especially if we're the one that pushed him there. 
that maybe got him hooked on this sin or addicted to this sin. Well, who are we then to not forgive once he's carried it out and we see all the consequences of that sin? And so he says, go to him because his soul is at stake and so that he can repent so that he can be forgiven. And so this is one of the things that he talks about here as a way of forgiving people when their sin is really against God. And so he assumes he's a brother already. He assumes there's already a relationship with this person before you would go to him. And so we would go to a brother and help him deal with his sin. It's not forgive if he justifies it. It's forgive if he repents and turns around and decides, I'm never going to allow that in my life anymore. And so it's only when he repents, not if we go, well, you know, I can see why you want to sin like that. No, it's only when he repents and turns around back to God. That's when God forgives, and that's when we forgive also. In Matthew 18, Jesus talks about forgiveness, but this seems to be give forgiveness with special circumstance. And so he gives us a place to work in this forgiveness and what happens with it. I think it's the same context. It assumes that this is a sin against God. This is not just something that's a sin against us. And so he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. I find it very interesting that we usually quote the very last verse in this passage about worship. And we think that it's where two or three are gathered in his name. There he is and he will worship. No, it's when you're dealing with forgiveness and two or three of you are gathered in his name and there's a real struggle with this forgiveness, then Jesus is in the midst of you. He says, I am giving this to you. I am empowering this. And so let's look at what he really says with this. First of all, it is a brother. It is somebody we already have a relationship with. You do not go to a stranger like this. You go to him only if he is a brother and you have this relationship. And so you tell him his fault. And so this says, if your brother sins against you, go tell him the fault. Because it's also a sin against God and it's putting his soul in jeopardy. And if he understands, then you've gained a brother because he's a brother in holiness and in forgiveness, and he's a brother because you guys are just close and love each other. But you're also not separated by anything of God, and now you've helped him to gain his forgiveness. If he doesn't listen, and of course this happens sometimes, if he doesn't listen, then take one or two, not any more than that. He gives you a specific number. And make sure of everything that is being said. Make sure that he understands that his soul is in jeopardy and it's not just you having something against him, that there are a couple of more people that have looked at the evidence and said, yeah, we think your soul is in jeopardy here. We think that you are at risk here and that you need this forgiveness of God. And so they're able to forgive. If he listens to them, you've gained a brother. If he refuses to listen to them, and this is a very last resort, go tell it to the church. 
the church probably already knows because this is for something that is not just with you. This is for something that is a public thing that affects everyone. And so go and talk to everyone and say, everyone go to this person. And that's what that means. Everyone go to this person. They ought to get 300 phone calls that day that it's told to the church. That everyone is a brother to them. And they are in jeopardy and we want them back. <clears throat> and that's what he talks about here is being able to do this. Now, realize also this is not an instantaneous thing because he doesn't give you the time period here. And sometimes we want to rush this time period. So you go to him and boy, it didn't work this week. He didn't listen to you. So by the two days later, you're going to take somebody else with you. And sure enough, he doesn't listen to them either. And so now there's two of you. And on Sunday, you tell it to the church. And by Monday, he hasn't really said anything or repented. So by Wednesday, he's disfellowshipped, right? No, that is not what this passage says. It's not what it's about. And so you go to him, and 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 you go to him until it is fairly obvious he isn't listening. And then you take two or three others, and you go to him, and go to him, and go to him, and go to him, and it may take months of you meeting and going to him and talking about forgiveness and talking about where he is before this ever goes to anybody else. At first, it's just between the two of you. And if we mess that one up, we've generally lost the whole thing. It needs to be that we have understood and have gone to him when it's just two of us. And then it's the best chance to get it solved. After this long period of time of everyone going to him, it will become obvious that we're no longer joined. That we're not really brothers. And it's as obvious to him as it is to us. And just speaking from a practical point of view, when this happens, it isn't like we need to treat him as the Gentile, it's he's going to treat us like we're Christian. And he doesn't want anything to do with us because we have gone to him so many times and tried to give him so many chances and been encouraging about his soul to the point where he says, I don't want this anymore. Leave me alone. And at the point where he says, leave me alone, then there's not much more that we're able to do. Because he is refusing to listen. And that's what that means. If he refuses to listen, not a uh, instant thing. But he has shut off all communication and said, I don't want you to talk to me anymore about this. And chances are he's going to withdraw himself from the church, from you, from the other guys that you took. And everyone goes that way. Even though this passage says, if your brother sins against you, I feel like this passage is talking about also a sin against God. It's not that, you know, he insulted me and I feel bad, and so therefore he owes me an apology. That's not the situation. You see, the passage right before this talks about the lost sheep. And so that's what he's thinking. There is a sheep that is lost, and now there's a brother who sins against you who is also lost. And the passage right after this is the unrighteous servant. And so you're dealing with a lot of sinful people here. And the sin is not just a offense against one person. The sin is an offense against God. And only when it is that and his soul is at risk would you ever go this way. Because Matthew is very clear when he talks about the prayer is you just forgive him if it's an offense against you. And if he just insulted you, let it go. 
is not that important. Certainly never take it to this kind of level. This is when his soul is in danger. Only then would you take it to other people. And I would suggest it be the elders or someone who is spiritual. Galatians 6.1 talks about you who are spiritual be able to restore someone. And so that's who we're really talking about that you would take and go with you, not someone who's on your side. In fact, it would be better if it's someone who's on their side that they would listen to. Because you're not trying to prove your point. You're trying to save their soul. You're not trying to win the argument. This is about getting people to be holy. Well, if it gets this far, this is the wrong way to do it. It means we failed. It means mercy has failed. It means God has failed. There's no forgiveness because there isn't any way to forgive. And so this is just a complete failure. It isn't that we should feel good or justified at all. In fact, we have completely failed if we get to this point. Even though it's what Jesus says to do, mercy should always win. Grace should always win. And we need forgiveness for all of us. There is a great example in the scripture that I want to just run through very quickly. Uh, it's about the prodigal son. And Jesus tells this example from a lost sheep, a lost coin, and now a lost son. And so he said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, forgive me, or give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Well, he thought he had the right plan, and he didn't. He decides he wants his inheritance, and so he asks the father for his inheritance. Is that a sin? Well... No, not technically. That's not a sin. And the father agrees, oddly enough, and divides the inheritance between them. And so both sons have their inheritance now. And even though the father might still live there and actually have control until the time of his death, the younger son takes his and leaves. And now he's gone to a far country and at this point, it looks like it does become a sin because he spends it in reckless living. Is it a sin that he wasted it all? Well, it might not be smart, but that isn't the sin. The sin is what he might have been doing with reckless living. And so, yes, he's done something against God. This is against God, not just a stupid son, but a son who has taken what he had as an inheritance and now has spent it on things that are sinful. And so he hires himself out when the famine comes. He can't get any other work. He's down to feeding pigs. He's down to starving to death. And he comes to a decision. Do you know any people like this? You know, I think if we think about it, there's a lot of times where we know people like this. They want to go off and they want to be on their own and they want to do whatever they want to do and they don't want any parents around to tell them what to do. They're going to make it so that they are inaccessible to their parents or to any other person so they can do whatever they want. And it happens. Then what happens when we have to deal with it? You notice the father does not come and get him. He has to come to himself first. And so Jesus continues, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I ter perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. 
and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And so we see the scenario where the son comes to himself and he knows that he has done something wrong. He says, my father's servants have it better than me. I think I might be able to get a job at his place. And so he goes back there and he comes to the father. Well, the father is waiting for him. The father has been looking for him for a long time, but he's waiting for the son to come back. And so he waits until the son comes back and he runs to meet him, but he doesn't give him a robe yet. He waits for the son's repentance. And the son says, I have sinned against heaven, God, and you. There is forgiveness on both sides needed. And he asked to just be made one of the higher servants. Well, the father gives him full status as a son, gives him the best robe, brings him the ring. He's now got the credit card, basically, which is the father's stamp with the ring. And he gives him the full son privileges and says, now we need to celebrate. There's a fatted calf. We've been waiting for an occasion. Now's the time for us to celebrate. And so the son has come back and repented. The son has come back with his repentance, and then the father can pronounce forgiveness, can give grace, something the son never deserved, and now he can give grace. Well, the story isn't finished yet, and this may be the main reason Jesus tells this story. The first part of it has been great for us to understand what forgiveness is about. But then he gives us this in Luke 15, 25. He says, now his older son was in the field and he came and he drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing and he called to one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And he was angry and he refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And this puts a whole new dimension on forgiveness, doesn't it? This is the part maybe that gets to us more than anything else. The older brother has stayed. He has seen what has happened to his father. And yes, the younger son has sinned against his father and against God in heaven but I'm not really sure he sinned against the older brother. He divided the inheritance, and both of them got their inheritance. And so the younger son has his inheritance, and the older son also has his inheritance. When the older brother finds out, he asks one of the servants, what's the celebration? Because he's out in the field working. And he tells him about the younger son who has come. And the father goes out to the younger son, and the father goes out to the older son. He treats both of them the same way. And yet, the older son does not respond to the father. His father came out, and his excuse is, look, I've served you all this time. I've been here serving, and I've never disobeyed a command. And you never gave me a goat to have a party that I could celebrate with my friends. And that always oh, interesting, but this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours 
has wasted all of his money, and now he's back, and now you think you're going to support him? I don't think he wants to support him at all. And he said, son, you're always with me. All that is mine is yours. I mean, literally, it has already been divided. Everything that his is the son's. But the son has never learned how to have his own party with his own goat. He has never given himself permission for that. He's trying to still be the good son. And as we look at the story, it's it's really sad that this guy needs to forgive. And he needs to be forgiven. And that's why this one stings a little bit, because that's where we find ourselves the most. We want to say other people need to be forgiven, but it's really us that needs to be forgiven as well. And in almost every situation, that's where we are going to be. It's halfway between forgiving others and God forgiving us. And so the older son can't forgive. He feels like there's an injustice that has been done to him. Not sure what the injustice is because none of it was his. Uh, He still has everything he ever worked for. He still has the father that he kept the relationship with. And yet he feels like this is a great injustice done to him. And the father can't bring peace to him by forgiving him. He's made his own place of torment. He's made it impossible because there is no forgiveness for the supposed injustice that's been done to him because there really isn't an injustice. But he feels it so strongly. He feels like he ought to be respected more. He ought to get more privilege because he has been there. He has done more. He He wants some kind of recognition for all of this service that he has given for the obedience and that he ought to be lifted up. There ought to be a celebration of him, and there's no celebration of him. There's also no forgiveness of him because he can't be forgiven for something that isn't wrong against him. And I think sometimes we want to be justified and we want some kind of forgiveness for us when we don't deserve anything and there is no forgiveness for us. In fact, we need to do the forgiving. We need to let some things go. And it's not as if we're the most important and need all the recognition for ourselves because we've been good. The recognition is for forgiveness, for mercy, for grace, not for performance. But see, we seem to want the praise for performance. And the rejoicing that takes place is not over performance. It's over the forgiveness, over the son that was dead and is now alive. And so the brother cannot accept this. He simply cannot allow himself to forgive, and he cannot be forgiven, and the relationship with the father is broken, and the relationship with his brother is broken, and so the prodigal son, we all know one, we have been one, but we're waiting for one to come home. It is our story. It is where we find ourselves, and it is important that we learn how to forgive and to not hold things that are not ours to hold, that we forgive and we allow God to hold whatever God wants to hold and to celebrate and to lift up whoever God wants to celebrate. Have you ever felt like this? They're just annoying, aren't they? Little brothers, little sisters, brother for sale, prices marked down. That's not the solution. That will not bring peace. Peace does not come from that. Peace comes from the forgiveness, from making people holy. When God makes us holy 
and we are able to help the people around us to become holy by our forgiveness and helping them to be forgiven by God. Because without forgiveness, there can be no peace.